However, you know, the military is quite careless with regards to plutonium. Uh, they often wash large quantities of plutonium waste in pipes, and sometimes they have criticality in the walls of the building. Really? I was shocked at the White Building at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You yeah. can actually look up the file where critical mass was obtained in the wall. Wow. And uh, people walking in and out uh, were hit with a fair amount of radiation as liquid. Uh, in and out went critical and went out of critical and in and critical, out of critical for a period of hours. But still in all, people doing that kind of work are required, are they not, to wear badges that would have reflected the, uh, the dose they were getting, wouldn't they? Well, believe it or not, in order to reconstruct the, the dose, uh, they put a donkey in that same room and they had the donkey uh, be exposed to critical mass from the wall to calculate exactly how much radiation the workers got. Huh. And this is how careless. Um, and you'd be shocked when you read the files. But, but again, the they, they, weren't, they, they weren't wearing uh, uh, dosometers? Uh, some of them were, some of them weren't. And it was not, you know, it was, again, wartime security and, and people, I mean, post-war security. People were very lax about these kinds of things. And, uh, well, I mean, like, for example, in, in 1961 in Idaho, uh, there was a worker who removed, manually removed the control rod out of the um, SL-1 reactor, the stationary low-power reactor unit one, and the reactor went super critical right under its feet, and the reactor exploded. I haven't even heard any of this. Yeah, this is Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, January 1961. Uh, three workers were blown apart when a reactor went super critical. Forget the meltdown. We're oh. talking about a small bomb going off right under the feet of Mr. John Burns, who was shot through the ceiling. The explosion was so great that the control rod went right through his body and impaled him his body on the ceiling of the oh reactor. Oh, God. I, I, I haven't heard any of this. Uh, Professor, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. I haven't heard any of this. Have you all? Have you ever? Have you heard these stories before? I certainly haven't. Aye, aye, aye. What a beginning. I'm Art Bell. Good evening. I'm Arthur George. My guest is Professor uh, Michio Kaku. And Professor, I, I let's go right back to this incident. I'm just curious as I can be to why anybody would march into a reactor room, grab a rod, and pull it out. I mean, what what would drive a person to do that in the first place? Well, uh, Mr. John Burns, back in January of 1961, was sitting on top of the stationary low-power reactor, Unit 1, operated by the United States Navy. Yeah. And he was told never, ever remove central control rod number 9 more than 6 inches. Right. Because if you remove the control rod, which regulates the chain reaction, dampens the chain reaction, if you remove central control rod number nine, more than six inches, the reactor would go super critical, and it would, in fact, uh, explode. That sounds uh, like an extremely serious warning. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, you would get super criticality, heating would occur, water would boil, and the boiling water would then create a steam explosion, which would blow the whole thing apart. Very bad. Yes. Well, so. that's what happened. Uh, reconstructions of the accident show that he tampered with central control rod number nine and removed it two feet. Two feet well, now, out of the reactor. Do we have any idea why he would do something with such a strong warning attached to it? Why would he do that? Well, first of all, we have to realize that reactors will blow up under certain conditions. It's often stated that reactors do not blow up like Hiroshima bombs. No, they don't blow up like Hiroshima bombs, but they do blow up like Chernobyl, like yes. SL-1. Right. It'll explode, steam explosion, hydrogen gas explosion. Right. Created by supercritic chaos, it will blow a reactor and blow the roof right off. Gotcha. There are two theories. Uh, the dominant theory is that he slipped. He was making routine repairs, oh. Uh, oh. and he slipped. It was New Year's. It was right after New Year's. He was probably a little tipsy, and uh, he... Oh. It removed the rod and then slipped and it jerked two feet out of the reactor, blowing him uh, to pieces. I mean, it shot him right to the, the ceiling of the reactor. He was impaled. Yeah, you said he was impaled by the rod itself and it hit the ceiling. Well, then what? Uh, then um, reactor crew, uh, safety crews went into the reactor site to find out what happened. They found that radiation levels were about 1,000 rands an hour. Uh, 500 rads will kill you. It was 1,000 rads an hour. Oh. Okay. Uh, just a few minutes in that site, you would get already the year's uh, maximum dose of radiation. Right. And they, they found two dead bodies on the ground, uh, and they looked for the third. They, were, they made repeated entrance into the reactor looking for the third. Finally, according to the report, 
One of the workers looked up and saw the third body, uh, John Burns, impaled on the ceiling. Now, there is a second theory that uh, proponents of nuclear power like to make, and that is that he was, John Burns was involved in a love triangle, and that he wanted to commit uh, suicide, and therefore blow one of the other rivals, also the kingdom come. And so he was apparently distraught and blew himself and his co-workers that were his rivals uh, to bits, uh, using nuclear power plants to do it. Oh. The, the point I'm raising is that... Do you, uh, do you favor one theory over the other, by the way? Uh, well, it was New Year's. It was January 2nd at 9 o'clock at night. And um, it was possible he was still suffering a hangover from New Year's. And so it's certainly possible that he could have slipped and uh, set the whole thing into uh, okay. motion. But, you know, we have to realize that, you know, nuclear power plants can become unstable. They don't simply melt like Three Mile Island. Uh, they can explode like Chernobyl, uh, they can explode like the SL-1, and they can go supercritical, and that supercriticality accidents are more common than you realize. Well, all right, here's one from Ray C., who is able to fast blast me in a little continued message while I'm doing the show from Wasilla, Alaska, and says, Hey, Art, ask Dr. Kaku about the day we almost lost Detroit when the only commercial fast breeder reactor, a Fermi-1, built in the U.S. partially melted. Is that true? That's right. This was kept hush-hush uh, in the 1960s, but Three Mile Island was not our first meltdown. Our first meltdown was Fermi-1, operated by Detroit Edison. Really? Uh, and it was a 2% core melt. 2% uh, of the core melted. I have pictures of the core showing melted, these melted rods of uranium dripping uh, fuel down to the bottom. Uh, what happened was a, it was in a, in a breeder reactor, which today would be considered a criminal to operate. These are very, very, these are very unstable reactors. Uh, they operate on highly enriched uranium, 20% enriched uranium. I, I didn't even know we had any active breeder reactors. I thought that was just, well, or, 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 or if we did, they were lab experiments ongoing, not anything full-scale running. No, it was, it was a commercial breeder reactor. A commercial. Everyone wants to forget because it melted and created a catastrophe, a potential catastrophe. To me, I didn't. I hadn't even heard about it. I, I again, I thought it was only in the lab where the, I would see scientific reports every now and then. Aha! Uh -huh, we have created this kind of reactor, or it can be created, but to have a full-scale model operating, I had no a idea. One. No, oh no, no, no idea. idea. Today, it would be considered criminal. If anyone tried to make a commercial breeder reactor, they're very unstable. Uh, the very first breeder reactor, the EBR-1, actually melted back in the 1950s. It was one of the first major melts of a nuclear reactor. Now they, they were able to stabilize it about one second before it would have exploded. Well, right. Anyway, then in the 60s, they had a commercial, not an experimental, a commercial reactor. Well, how did that happen? I mean, how did we get a commercial reactor? If it's something that's not even safe in a lab, for God's sake, how could it get built as a commercial reactor? Well, they were cowboys in those days. Man, I guess. <laughs> they thought they were pushing the envelope, and that they were they, they were the cowboys that were going to tame the atom. Well, yeah, but if you if you can't contain this thing in the lab, how can you build something commercially based on what? Well, you can't, but they did. But they did. Oh.